Greetings, I'm Roger Newbold, and welcome to episode number 29 of Experience Photography. You know, my fellow photographer, my good friend, partner, and editor for this episode is Mr. Matt Rich. You know, he's the poet of nature and the talent that makes all of this vlog project work. Are you there, my friend? Roses are red, violets are blue. <laughs> Excellent. In episode 28, we talked about standing on the shoulders of giants, you know, and uh, taking advantage of the ground that they broke so that we could achieve more freely the things that we do. We examined photographing in a vernacular style, Seeing and working within your own area, your own home, your own neighborhood, your children, your friends. You know, that's a great batch of subject matter. I hope the advice helped you to peer over your peers. Now, gazing from the shoulders of giants of nature photography allows us to appreciate that nature photography, well, it perhaps is the most oddly labeled division within the photographic arena. Nature photography overlaps the field of sometimes considered categories including wildlife or landscape or garden photography. My goodness, it covers the entire gamut of landscape flora, fauna, imaging of all kinds of beautiful and wonderful natural environments, including animals, plants, flowers, anything living within it, no matter which compass point you choose. You know, there's a massive amount of info that you may desire to be successful. We're going to start with equipment. <laughs> First of all, it's because it's so darn appealing and fun. If you consider, you may be, you know, stalking elephants or lions. And one single day, you need a 100 to 400 zoom or maybe longer. If you're capturing the fall migration along the North American flyway, you know, you may need a gigantic 600 F4. You know, and with that, you'd need one of them big old stout gimbal heads on your tripod. However, when capturing the spring blossoms, you may need a 100 millimeter macro in, junction, in uh, conjunction with a matching flash unit or reflector or mirrors, or something to set up to reveal the beauty of the home and garden. You may need whew, one of those 14 to 24 zooms. That might fill the bill. If you end up working in the rainforest, make certain, <laughs> make certain that you use weather resistant gear and cover. As you may have discovered, the correct equipment for the job will really be advantageous to you, the photographer. In order to separate subject matter from background, maybe you should procure all your lenses in F2 at least. Hey, that equipment list can fracture your back and fracture your bank account simultaneously. So many specialized items may desire, be desired that you have to consider rentals for a while. Most photographers cannot afford all of this equipment until they're well down the path in their work. So, you know, find a good set. Stick with it for a while, as long as you can. One wide zoom, one middle zoom, a long zoom, maybe a tele-extender and an extension tube. That, that should cover most of your actual work. 
As far as which camera body to obtain, <laughs> everyone wants the large sensor. You want a, a big 100 megapixel sensor that shoots 20 frames a second. Man, and it's got to fit in your pocket and it's got to be under $400 a unit. Uh, uh, me too. Yeah, me too. It doesn't happen, but it'd be nice. So whatever you have will do if you maximize your handling techniques. Use it wisely until you are absolutely sure you must change or add to your inventory. Carry only what you need, unless you have a voluntary bag schlepper. They're, they're really handy. One big recommendation that I might make to you, before you invest in any major dollars, yen, pounds, euros, consider the long range plan. If you don't have one, you're going to get one right now. Bodies and lenses work together. So don't invest heavily in one brand until you are sure that's the brand you want to stick with forever. There are small handful of brands that actually have uh, what you'd call a top line pro style body available. Well, start there, but buy a lower cost body because once you're profoundly outfitted in lenses, you cannot afford to switch brands. You may eventually require a, a specialized body that does everything as near waterproof as can be. You know, wow. But take a look at figure number one. You may need one of these. Now let's look at the history for a sec. The origins of wildlife photography can be traced way back to the early days of photography in the middle of the 19th century. One of the earliest wildlife photographers was taken by photographs, sorry, was taken by uh, a British photographer named Cherry Kirton back in 1892. He captured the first photographs of a bird's nest with eggs and he and his brother Richard were pioneers of wildlife photography and their images of birds were used to produce the first ever nature photography book. Now uh, British bird's nests, the brothers uh, innovated the portraits of animals and safaris to the savannas of Africa and helped popularize the genre. In the early 20th century, photographer and United States representative from Pennsylvania, George Shiras III, revolutionized wildlife photography. He began <laughs> using camera traps and best of all, exploding magnesium flash powder. Boah, what a bang out of life. He captured images of wildlife in the dark. And in 1906, he was deemed the father of wildlife photography by National Geographic. Shiraz was an avid conservationist and he believed in wildlife photography and it was an irreplaceable medium for revealing unknown and attesting to the beauty of an undangered world. Now, in the middle of the 20th century, wildlife photography began to gain wider recognition as a legitimate form of artistic expression. There were photographers like Peter Beard Art Wolf, they began using wildlife photography as a means of conservation. They used their images to raise awareness about the need to protect endangered species and their habitat. Let's take a peek at figure number two. 
Now, John Shaw, wow, he produced breathtaking images of wildlife and it filled the pages of his books with visual, visual excitement. And we can see that in figure number three. They, I mean, you ever seen a leopard ready to pounce on your head? I mean, that's exciting stuff. Now, Guy Tao, he's captured some of the contemporary in, uh, images, both close, things right at hand, and images far away, across to maybe the meadow. Take a look at figure number four. What a cool thing. Uh, I believe that's a big old moose standing out there. What a deal. Way to go, guy. But you know, if you're going to do this kind of photography, you really have to have a plan of action. Photographers have challenging nightmares about having to shoot in nature because it's totally uncontrollable. Only you'll need to have a wide variety of equipment, but you must have a real plan of action when you go outside and start shooting. You got to plan for the best time of day. You should research and plan your outdoor shoot before, you know, pulling on your hiking boots and hitting the trail. Strategically choose the right time of day and the lighting for the images that you can envision. You might find morning and evening is best for that natural, soft-looking light. The light will be less harsh than the blaring shadows of midday. Pack light. Pack right. Planning is also about making sure that you have the right gear. You're at the mercy of the elements outdoors, and often you're a long distance away from camp or a car, or assistance. So you don't want to be unprepared, whether it's 10 degrees or 150 degrees outside. You're going to have to be out there all day. So I recommend consult a backpacking expert. If you're doing multi-day and overnight camping, they'll have the best information on, you know, maybe the type of food and amount of water and other necessary gear that you may have to have and take on your expedition. Now packing light is always good, but don't forget to have some type of communication equipment. I, I mean that is really imperative. Make, make sure you have extra batteries Maybe a solar charger, as we've recommended before. Extra storage cards. Uh, a GPS unit, or at least a compass and map. Uh, get, get some lightweight knee pads. Man, I know how many times they've saved my life. Now, appropriate clothing is vital. Bring something waterproof to protect you and your gear. Pack a hat. Keep the sun off your head. Keep the rain and snow out of your eyes and face. It can always, the hat can always be used to, you know, hold up and shade your camera if it's sunny. Perfect your exposure. One of the biggest challenges with outdoor photography and capturing magnificent landscapes is getting the right exposure. Even during the golden hour, if a cloud moves in overhead, your images could suddenly be underexposed due to less light. Use a quick uh, fix to, uh, to check your exposure and check as you shoot. Now, remember, never delete any photo while you're out in the field. Never. Wait till you can see them indoors. Get the full appreciation for what's there. 
photographing nature uh, in detail, the, the flora, plants are the perfect subject when it comes to predictability, but, you know, they're also very common. And rather than being intimidated by the commonality, remember this allows you to play and try a whole batch of new things. Make creativity important. Taking simple shots of flowers and trees in the garden, it's a good start. And practice makes perfect when you're out to capture something that has a lot of detail that you want. Now, five techniques for ph photographing plants. Shield your subject with a diffuser, some type of scrim, uh, a bounce light, or use a reflector. Sometimes you may have to bring some clamps and use ties to hold flowers in place. And then you'll have more control over your subject with plant photography. But you still have to deal with the weather. And don't let a, a breeze ruin your long exposure. Aperture priority may give you more control over depth of field. And it can improve the results. So choose wisely between shutter speed and depth of field. Choosing the right time of year is especially important for plant photography. You know, summer is really popular season as many flowers are in bloom. But bright colors are easily defined. And don't ignore winter. It has the presence of snow can enhance any kind of image because you have a giant contrast between stems uh, leaves, branches, it's, it's great. And in evergreen plants, uh, when they're surrounded by snow, <laughs> what terrific. Take a look at figure number five. Photographing animals or the fauna. Well, when it comes to photographic animals, capturing creatures in motion <laughs> Being at the right place at the right time is really key. From snapping a robin returning to its nest or experimenting with bird photography, patiently observing a cheetah while it's stalking its prey while on a wildlife safari. Shooting, planning, reviewing, the specified techniques will help you improve your chances of success. However, the most imperative thing is to get out there. You know, you got to see the images. Look at figure, uh, figure number six. This, this is a pair, uh, a polar bear, and... Uh, a mandrel by our friend Greg Smith. I, I think they're fantastic. How did Greg get them? He gets out and he goes. And that's, that's the absolute thing you have to do. What makes uh, a great nature photography? It's a person that is passionate. You need both ambition and confidence so that you can see can succeed in competitive field. You have to be self-critical in order to show only, only show your best work. Have the drive to work hard. Refine your technical and your creative skills. And that means a whole lot of practice. Inter competitions and depending on you know, their fees and deadlines, enter as much as you can. Because the more prestigious the event, the better the awards will be given. And the more notoriety and leverage you will have later in negotiating sales of your work. Now, my advice 
and it's worked for me for a long time. My advice is to keep your day job. Do what you do to earn money. And then when you're shooting, do your best. Have a uh, professional attitude. Become that nature photographer. It's not going to happen overnight. And you'll need to invest and develop both your creative skills and most of all, business skills. Have patience. And you have available resources to fund your passion until you receive your big break. Now, remain positive about your vision and outcome. Persevere through all the changes and setbacks. It doesn't last forever. It will go on. Learn to work well under pressure and learn how to meet tight deadlines. Yeah. Well, my friends, today's time has come and I believe we've been well spent in our time and putting together another exciting branch of photography from the shoulders of giants. All about nature photography, flora and fauna, equipment, my goodness, review this if you have to. Go through it again and again. Get the tips. Learn what to do. If you've enjoyed the tips we've given you in this presentation, I'd appreciate it if you'd share it with your friends. Why let them make mistakes when they can side vent all of this stuff and, and jump into it? Give us a big thumbs up. Tinkle that little bell. Anytime we get new content, you'll get it. Help us build our site, and we'll help you build your skills. Well, here we are again. A tip of the hat to you, my friends. Until we meet again on screen, cheerio.